Well, we are really glad to be back with you. I don't remember, it's been two, three years probably since we were here. Uh, some of you have been able to uh, come to some of our other programs and presentations. We're out of Grand Junction, Colorado. So if you get out to Colorado and you want a field trip of the Colorado National Monument, look us up. If you want to take a field trip of Yellowstone National Park, we do those in the summertime. This summer we have three of those. We also do tours of Costa Rica, looking at design in Costa Rica. And so if you're interested in any of that, please, uh, you know, take our brochures, whatever. There's, um, there, we'll be passing around a sign-up sheet for our newsletter, Think and Believe, if you'd like that. I actually grew up in Mankato, and uh, I got to be in college, and I decided I wanted to go to the mountains, so I left. But uh, <laughs> I, get out to, I got out to Colorado and met a Colorado mountain man, so I ended up staying in Colorado. We, were, we taught up in Alaska for a time, and uh, I grew up going to church, and believing in God and believing in Jesus, believing in the Bible and creation, but in school I was taught evolution. I didn't know what to do with it, so I tried to just put a line down the middle, you know? Creation over on one side with what I thought was the Bible, what I thought uh, about church and so on, but then on the other side, I also was learning evolution in school, and so on that side of the line, I put what I thought was science and what I thought the Bible taught. They didn't meet. That was in high school. In college, I went to Gustavus my first year, thinking that it, I would get good Bible teaching, and I ended up being told that Genesis is a myth. It was written for primitive people who couldn't understand the science of evolution. They told me the days were not real days, they were periods of time millions of years long, and that God used evolution as his method of creating. Well, at that point, that wall came down, right? I could, I could believe them both now. God must have used evolution. I thought it was a good solution. For a while, it worked for me. I think it kept me from going totally into atheism. But my, my life was a mess back then. I really wasn't walking with the Lord. I wasn't following, following his ways. We got up to, uh, I went out to Colorado State University. I got a degree in biology. Dave was in, uh, studying for his degrees in mathematics back then. And, uh, you know, we both believed in evolution at that point. He became a believer in Jesus during that time, uh, be shortly before I met him. And after we started going together, we started reading the Bible, but we never did get to Genesis. I don't know why we didn't start in Genesis, but we didn't. But I think God protected us in that way because I already had this compromised view of Genesis. It wasn't until we were teaching in Alaska, one day I was walking or, work, or walked into this little secondhand book, uh, secondhand store, and I found a book for five cents. It was called Evolution, The Fossils Say No by Dr. Duane Gish. Some of you remember the little teeny thin book? I got it for a nickel and I read it and I went, whoa, I thought the fossils proved evolution. They're the only hard evidence we have, right? I thought fossils were the best evidence of evolution. And then as I, I read it, uh, Dave had a better background in geology and paleontology than I did. I gave the book to him, he read it, and we thought, this guy's either nuts or he knows something we don't know. We better start doing some studying. And as we began to study, we became more and more convinced that creation is true. And as Dave's going to talk to you tonight about the fossils, you're going to see that the fossils do not prove evolution. And in fact, they are now oftentimes thought of as an embarrassment for evolution because they really don't, you know. And so Dave will show you tonight what the traditional evolutionary model of fossils is, but then also an alternative model that, that fits with what the Bible teaches about creation. In the beginning, God created, right? Genesis 1 and 2 tells us how he did it. Six days, he rested on the seventh day. We see that at the end of that time, it was all very, very good. But then what happened? Genesis 3 to 5, we learn about that, don't we? And we see how the fall came in. 
in Genesis 3 to 5. And we see the entrance of sin and death and evil. And as we have been going around now, this is uh, next year will be the 40th anniversary of Alpha Omega Institute. And over those years, students usually have a problem with the idea of, well, if this was a good earth and if there's a good God, then why do we so see so much suffering in the world, right? That's, that's the second most common question or reason why students give for not responding to the gospel. First one being evolution. They think that, well, the Bible can't possibly be true. And so we learn about the entrance of sin and death and evil and suffering when we read Genesis chapter 3, don't we? But then we get to Genesis 6 through 8, we see evidence of the flood. And the Bible talks about that flood, but as we look at the world around us, we see evidence of that flood. Now, it took us some time to come to realize that. We, when we were in Alaska, there was a pastor up there who was familiar with Western Colorado, where we come from. And he said to us one day, don't you just see evidence of the flood all over Western Colorado? Well, we were polite. We didn't laugh in his face, but we went home and we laughed. We thought that was the funniest thing. He believed in the flood and he believed in the ark and all those stinking animals, you know? And, and we just ignored pretty much what he had to say. But you know what? The next time we got back to Western Colorado, we went out on the desert. You know what we saw? Everywhere we looked, we saw evidence of the flood. Rock layers laid down by water containing what? Fossils. Yeah, we're, we should sing that song tonight since we're in the choir room, you know? <laughs> Billions of dead things buried in rock layers laid down by water all over the earth, right? Isn't that what we see? All over the earth, you see evidence. These, these creatures that died in the flood that are contained in the rock layers. And then we also see evidence of massive, massive amounts of erosion very large canyons that have been eroded away and, and other features that speak to us of the evidence for the flood. That, but biblically, where is that? Genesis 6 through 8. So we've got creation, we've got the fall, we've got the flood, and we see scientific evidence that fits with what the scripture teaches. And then Genesis 9 through 11, what's the most famous thing in those chapters? Tower of? Tower of? Babel, right? And we see evidence. God said, spread out, multiply, fill the earth. And they said, no, we're all going to stay together. We're going to build a tower, a monument to, to reach to the heavens. And God said, no way, right? And he confused their languages. And you know what? When he confused the languages, he did a really good job. We've been, we've been blessed and privileged to be able to go all over the world teaching creation. And I tell you what, you get in a place where you don't know the language, and you just go, God sure did a good job confusing the languages. And so Genesis 1 through 11 is foundational, we believe, for faith throughout the rest of Scripture and also for understanding science. And so tonight, Dave's going to specifically talk about the fossil evidence. I'm sure a lot of you have studied it, but maybe some of you haven't. And so tonight, we'll take some questions at the end. So if you have questions, go ahead and jot them down or something. And uh, you ready? Yeah. Okay, well, it's good to be with uh, you once again here. And uh, we hope that uh, you'll be able to enjoy what you're seeing here. And if you don't like the topic tonight, you can blame Julie. She is the one who chose that. <laughs> Anyhow, so... And it, we really want to see the fossil record in light of creation. So what do the fossils say about evolution? And I say nothing, the rocks don't talk. But we do talk for them, don't we? We try to look at the evidence and see what we can see from it. And by the way, the clipboard that is being sent around, print your name and address, and give us your email too, if you can, because this way we can... Uh, alert you to things more rapidly as we uh, have things that come up. So that's free publication, think and believe, okay? And uh, basically most of us are taught in schools and wherever else you look that 
the fossil record takes a great big bite out of the theory of evolution. No, you're not taught that. Takes a big bite out of the Bible, correct? Yeah, and so when we look at that say, really? Can you believe the Bible and believe in the fossils? What are you gonna do with this thing? I was actually uh, uh, back there teaching on a television program when I was about 10 years old. And at that point, I was teaching how the study of rocks and fossils proved evolution. Already at that age, I could, I could actually teach it because that is all I had ever been taught, okay? Never heard anything about creation all the way through my training, through high school, through college, university, getting my degrees, and I have both mathematics, then went back, got another geology degree as well. Uh, I never heard anything about of creation, and not until Mary Jo found a book for five cents in the secondhand bookstore. Okay, so when you don't have the information, what do you do? Do you throw out the Bible? Throw out evolution? What are the options, right? Maybe you can find a compromise, okay? Anyhow, and uh, well, we tried that. It's called theistic evolution. That didn't work scientifically or even biblically. So what about research the evidence? Most people don't think about doing that, right? Look into it. And we didn't know to research the evidence until we picked up that book for five cents. And then all of a sudden, it opened up new horizons, I'm going to say. And all of a sudden, we said, hmm, we better really start doing the research here. And in fact, the more we started doing the research, the more Mary Jo and I evolved from evolutionists to creationists. And like she said, it didn't take a million years to do it, okay? Uh, but anyhow, in the process, we started finding out that evolution is not science. Oh man, try that at one on the university right out of the bat. You get things thrown at you sometimes, right? No, they're pretty tame, okay? It's okay. But it is not science. It is a philosophy, but it is posing as though it were science. This whole idea is the main pillar of what's called a naturalistic worldview. And that worldview says everything in the universe from the universe itself to the beginning of life to you are all product of natural processes without ever there being a God or a designer present to help. It's all natural and it's usually presented as atheistic, okay? Uh, so that's what naturalism is. We have to understand this is the worldview that is being taught to all of our students. And it was taught that to me Clear back when, I didn't even know I was being indoctrinated in that, okay? So students are chained to this idea, part because that's all they ever hear, right? They don't hear any other potential. And so then they're also taught, if you want to be a good scientist, you have to believe in evolution. You're going to have to shed this God thing. Have you heard, ever heard that before? Lots of nods, okay? Of course you have. And here's Dr. Scott Todd kind of telling us that. Even if all the data point to an intelligent designer, such an hypothesis is excluded from science because it is not naturalistic. Yeah, it's not naturalistic. So we can't even look at that possibility. That was part of a, a court case. Well, here tonight, I'm going to be happy to say, thinking is allowed. You can think out of the box, can't you? And see if there is a, an explanation that does involve God. Wow, isn't that amazing? You know, Darwin published his book in, in 1859 on the origin of species. And uh, you might say, hmm, what did he think about the fossil record? Was he wrong? Well, guess what? He was right on in part of what he said. Uh, and he said that geology assuredly does not reveal any such finely graduated organic chains. And this, perhaps, is the most obvious and gravest objection which can be urged against my theory. 
And then he said the explanation lies in keep digging. <laughs> okay, that's basically it. As I believe in the extreme imperfection of the geologic record. So in other words, keep digging, you should find the fossils. If you don't, you can reject my theory. All right, so uh, Niles Eldridge uh, said this in 1982. 120 years of paleontological research later, it has become abundantly clear that the fossil record will not confirm this part of Darwin's predictions, nor is the problem a miserably poor record. The fossil record simply shows that this prediction is wrong. Guess what? We have now over a billion fossils out there that have been cataloged. And guess what? They don't support evolution. They don't. That's a big problem for the theory of evolution. I'm going to give you three reasons tonight why the fossil record supports the creation, the fall and the flood, the biblical record, and offers devastating evidence against the theory of evolution, or Darwinian, at least, evolution. We're going to look at that. If evolution is true, what would we expect to find? We find a record when we dig in the rock layers of constant change over supposedly millions and millions of years, leaving a lot of links in the fossil record, and we should see how the life went from very low forms, way down here, to more and more complex forms further up the column. Right? That's what you should expect to find. All right, if the creation is true, I'd expect things to be complex everywhere you look because we're created in an ecosystem. It has to work together. There's got to be an extreme level of complexity in order to do that. Okay? And I would see that things would be staying put, not the type of broad evolutionary change that evolution needs. Okay? Staying put. Stasis, it's called. And distinct kinds. In the biblical record, Genesis, God says a whole bunch of different times, God created things after their own kind. Not one kind changing into another kind, but after their own kind. And so I would expect to find something like distinct kinds in the fossil record. So what do we see? Back when I was teaching on that television program, because that's all I'd ever been taught was evolution, I was saying the rock layers of the earth formed the, per the pages of earth's history. How can I remember that clear back when I was 10 years old? Okay, but it stuck with me. That was my first line, by the way. <laughs> you don't want to mess that one up because it's downhill from then on. But anyhow, but what happens is I think that now that geologic record and the geologic column supports creation, the fall and flood, not evolution. That's what I've come to the conclusion to think. First of all, way down in the Cambrian, way down above the piano there, okay, uh, basically you'd expect the life forms way down there to be very, very simple. And then as time marches on, it should get more and more and more complex. That makes sense? Sure. All right, let's look at some of those creatures like trilobites down there, and you find out they have extremely complex eyes. Nothing leading up to them. Wait, nothing leading up to them. And all of a sudden, you see trilobites with eyes, and you wonder, what's going on here? Not only trilobites, but clear down in the Cambrian now, they have found a whole bunch of fossils, a whole bunch of eyes, because they had a lens, and those things would be preserved. There were over 3,000 lenses when they found those eyes, lenses, and I like what they said. Those lenses, that looks like the eye from a recently swatted fly. We know those are very complex eyes, don't we, from a fly. And yet, another one they said, their discovery reveals that some of the earliest animals possessed very powerful vision. Similar eyes are found in many living things, living insects, such as robber flies. But you know what? They would say, it can't be a robber fly eye. Do you know why? Because insects supposedly haven't evolved for another couple hundred million years. 
there, there can't be a robber fly there. But yes, it's a dead ringer for a robber fly, all right? I like the Denver Museum's Cambrian Explosion exhibit. And they said, and I've added a word there in yellow or gold, 545 million, I'm saying evolutionary years ago, there was an explosion of life and all the different body shapes and plans, get this word, popped into existence. Talk about popping, my eyes popped out. Okay, yeah, whoa, nothing slow and gradual, suddenly it was there. That, that's not Darwinian evolution, is it? Now they found a petrified brain and they were able to do a scan on it. And they find out it's exactly the same as the arthropod living today. The same, not any difference, okay? Okay, so complexity, you better believe it. Everywhere you look in the fossil record, and this idea of stasis, not change. Uh, here's a, a fossil and a, and a shell and its uh, living counterpart. No change, fat sassafras. <clears throat> Le uh, leaves are still sassafras leaves, aren't they? Mm -hmm. Anyhow, not even the vein structure has changed on that thing. Pine cones are pine cones, supposedly over 140 million years with no change. That doesn't make sense. Same thing with this bug found in amber. All right? Not one dif difference between that bug it found in the amber and what we have living today. All right? Stasis. Dragonflies. 140 million years of evolution, and you still have dragonflies. Okay? You do. Uh, some of them in the past were much bigger. Great big wingspans, too, right? And the interesting design feature of a dragonfly that I say is design, they can lift 15 to 25 times their body weight. Our airplanes don't, don't do that, all right? Yeah. I like this one on the uh, spider. They found a brand new spider here just a, f a couple weeks ago, okay? Well, one month ago. Anyhow, uh, but guess what? What's it look like? Well, of course, that is, the, that is an actual picture of the spider, but the fossil was exactly like it. All right? No difference. And uh, so spiders have been spiders, except they were large. This one was larger than the living variety today. But so what? I, I can be in the fossil record, and I'm going to look at, oh, look at that shrimp there. Uh, that's, uh, and that one over there is very tall. They must be different species. So, no, you don't do that. Now they also found a 110 million year old supposedly spider had reflective eyes that was actually preserved in the fossil. That was a 2019 fossil. And uh, back uh, they found in 2011 a golden orb spider and uh, it's unchanged supposedly for 165 million years and they made webs. I had read another place where they found a spider web that is um, in the, on the Silurian Devonian border. That's even more, that's way down there. And they say, hmm, I wonder what they use the web for. You know why they're asking that question? Because insects supposedly hadn't evolved yet. So I think I know why they use that web. And I don't believe in the idea of the evolutionary idea. But insects have always been insects. And uh, when you find a fossil insect, we can identify it. OK, I like this one in Denver Museum. The first sharks evolved, made it a little easier to read there, evolved 450 million <coughs> evolutionary years ago. Sharks have changed very little over the years. <laughs> You'd expect over 450 million years to a lot more change, wouldn't you? They actually found a living shark. It was swimming, pretty well ready to die here, but it was still living. And they realized, hold on, it's unchanged from the fossil counterpart, as near as they could tell, supposedly of 450 million years old. Unchanged. Again, we're seeing stasis here. Things are staying put. This is a fish that was found in the Cambrian, way down there, in 2014. 
They had advanced eyes, they had blood vessels, gills, digestive system, and muscular swimming. First of all, what do you see? Extreme complexity, correct? That's number one you're seeing that. And things are staying put. It's still a fish, isn't it? So the coelacanth, as you all know, probably was extinct supposedly 65 million years ago. Uh, had their heyday maybe 400 million years ago. And, uh, but now they found it still living off the coast of Madagascar. And uh, they've been doing a little research on that thing. It's unchanged from what they can tell from the fossil record, unchanged. And uh, those two front uh, fins, all of the different scientists have been calling those proto-legs, or should I say all the philosophers have been calling them proto-legs. What does that mean? On its way to becoming a leg. How do you know? You're not watching it. And then when they took the video of the living coelacanths, they found out, guess what? It looks pretty fishy. All right. That fin was used, what, for swimming, not for crawling up on land. Okay, so anyhow. When you find a feather in the fossil record, you can tell it's a feather, can't you? And we do find fossilized woodpeckers in the fossil record, unchanged. Okay, unchanged from what we have now. When we look at the fossil record, bats have always been bats. Over 1,000 bats, now 1,400 bats have been found. Not one of them is intermediate, showing how a bat came into being. Okay? Hmm. All right, here's hummingbirds, are always hummingbirds. The ama I like the uh, reviewer here. The amazing thing about this fossil is that it's essentially a modern hummingbird. My mind is a little blown. And I love his humor. Where the whole hovering tribe came from remains up in the air. <laughs> oh, yeah, hummingbirds are hummingbirds, aren't they? Cats have always been cats. Here's the lizard, no change. It was found in amber. And uh, huh. we have the same species living today. All right? No change whatsoever. So things are staying put. Stasis, not a bunch of change. About the distinct kinds, we can quote a whole bunch of people, but guess what the uh, textbook show? It shows how one kind will change into another kind, like salamanders into mice. That's right. And the textbook will actually tell you this is how evolution takes place, slow and gradual changes. And then they show you this great artwork. That's what you're looking at. You're not seeing the evidence. In fact, they didn't find anything in between but the salamanders and then the mice. Okay, the artwork convinces young people, like it did me, not the actual evidence. All right? Very important to understand. Evolutionist David Kitts wrote in the magazine called Evolution. He says evolution requires intermediate forms between species. But the study of fossils, paleontology, does not provide them. Interesting, huh? All right. He's an evolutionist, too. Errol White, again, believe in an evolution. He wrote a number of years back. But whatever ideas authorities may have on the subject, the lungfishes, that's your great-great-granddaddy, according to evolution. But he said the lungfishes, like every other major group of fishes that I know, have their origins firmly based on, what's that word? Nothing. Nothing. Nothing leading up to the lungfishes, supposedly your great-great-granddaddy, right? And then he said, as an evolutionist, I have often thought how little I should like to have to prove organic evolution in a court of law. <laughs> yeah. Okay, Stephen Jay Gould even admitted it, too. He was a staunch evolutionist. He always believed in evolution. But he did admit the extreme rarity of transitions in the fossil record persists as the shh trade secret of paleontology, all right? Hmm. So every one of the predictions that the evolution model would say about the fossil record, 
Absolutely no. No, on every point. All right, and in the creation thing, what do we see? We see groupings of animals, but not one group changing into another group, changing into something else. Yeah, you see frogs, you see dogs and horses, etc., but not something in between. And that's what it says, Genesis chapter 1, after their own kind, ten times. There it is, ten times. All right. So every one of the predictions we might make from the about the fossil record from the biblical record, biblical creation, is yes, it fits beautifully. And you say, wait a minute. <laughs> I've seen a lot of pictures in textbooks showing evolution. And I will have to say you're right. There were pictures, though. <laughs> they were strictly pictures, weren't they? And so, yes, you do see those. All right, so anyhow, uh, you see pictures of the horse evolution. Or you go to the uh, Natural History Museum right here in Minneapolis a number of years ago. What did you see? Horse evolution, right? And it shows you how the dawn horse called uh, Eohippus had a lot of spots. And this was, this was out of a textbook, by the way. A lot of spots, and then fewer spots for Mesohippus, and then modern horse with no, no spots. That's great for convincing young people that evolution is true. But what can you tell about spots from a fossil? Nothing, right? Not a thing. Because spots aren't preserved. All right? That's it. There's a problem with the foot structure. They are still having a hard time getting around. And number two, how do you change from a browsing tooth to a grazing, or a, yeah, a browsing tooth or a grazing tooth, leaving no transitions in the fossil record? The number of pair of ribs go back and forth without any pattern. It doesn't work, okay? You would expect the bones of present day horse to be found on the very top rock layers, his supposed ancestors way below, right? But in the John Day country, now also in South America, they have found the bones of modern present day horse in rock layers at and below his supposed ancestors. Now, you can't be your own grandmother, so there's got to be a problem here, okay? And by the way, the guy on the left called Eohippus isn't even Hippus for horse. His correct scientific name is Hyracotherium. And we have living Hyracotheriums today. And here's one right here. All right. It's about the size of a rabbit. How would you like to put a saddle on that beast? <laughs> You're not going to get too far, are you? OK. Anyhow. Yeah, so much for horse evolution right there. Here's a textbook picture that was put in textbooks a bunch of years ago. And it showed how a fish turned into the amphibian. <laughs> now, when you see great artwork like that, you say, what's the evidence? Great artwork, what's the evidence? What was the evidence at that time? Nothing. They didn't have a scrap. Since that time, they've had five or six different potentials, candidates, everyone fizzled. And then we'll get to the last one in a minute. But look what the textbook says. Even though they didn't find any in transitions, they said transitional forms or missing links show how this process of evolution took place. <laughs> a fourth grader should look at that and say, how can something missing show anything? But they're taught to believe their textbooks, right? So they must assume there must be links. Okay, every one of these supposed candidates has fizzled. The last one that Bill Nye, the science guy, used in the debate against Ken Ham is Tiktaalik, right? There it is, right there. And listen to the evolutionary mileage they're trying to get. They said thick wrist bones. Time out. It's a fin bone. Why call it a wrist bone? Unless somebody's trying to draw you into evolution. Okay? Okay. But, uh, you know, Bill and I should never have used that because by the time he used it, it was already dismissed. 
They were digging in Poland. They found a trackway of four-footed creatures preserved in the sand, in the mud. Four-footed creatures. And yet it was much older than Tiktaalik. And so you have four-footed creatures walking around before the animal that, that was going to evolve into four-footed creatures came on the scene. I like what uh, Jennifer Clack here, University of Cambridge, said. We thought we'd pin down the origin of limb tetrapods. We have to rethink the whole thing. <laughs> okay. This is out of a fourth grade unit study. Okay. There it is right there. And it's going to show how the dog-like creature up on top eventually evolved into a whale. And that's what they're teaching. And that's what kids should do. They should laugh at that idea. Right? should laugh at it. It seems ridiculous. And most young people will do so. And older ones, too. Well, there they are. There it is. There's the dog-like creature, and there's that whale. It's going to evolve right into it. All these is time, right? Yeah, right. And then they show you the picture, and you say, wow, what was the evidence here? What evidence? And that's all they had were a couple of patches of the jaw, a few teeth. That's it. No other bones at that time. But look what the artist gives you. Whew. It must be true, right? So that is uh, the first one in the lineup. The second one, Pachycetus. This was on the front cover of Science Magazine. Wow. Called Pachycetus. Found in Pakistan. Cetus for whale. Okay? Uh, but anyhow, somebody should have looked, that, looked at that cover and said, great artwork. It's not even that great. Uh, but what's the evidence? What's the evidence for that? It turns out the evidence that they had at that time were only two small pieces of jaw and one bone at the back of the head. Is that enough evidence to get all that information about what he looked like? Evidently not, right? Then they made that bone, that uh, claim in that magazine that bones prove whale walked. Time out, they didn't have any legs. Backbone, tail. How can something without any legs prove anything walked? Young people need to be asking those questions, right? And that's your job, is to go out and find some. And if you don't have kids of your own or grandkids, go down in the street and borrow some. All right? <laughs> go get some. There's lots of them out there. This, again, now they have more bones for Pachycetus. And here's what they think he looked like. Anybody sm smell a long-legged rat? So my question is this, which is the best model? Was it the 1983 model or the 2004 model? In other words, will the real Pachycetus please stand up? <laughs> yeah, some of you are from my era. <laughs> Dr. Carl Werner did a study on the whales supposedly meant to prove evolution. And uh, he said, after this study, and after looking at gingerish's stuff, he said all eight characteristic the gingerish reported as whale features are disturbingly non-whale features. And yet, he's supposedly the expert on it, right? Now, they pr brought in this thing called ambulocetus. Again, cetus for whale, okay? And, most, and look at that great artwork over there on the right, right? Great art. That's even better than the last one. But great artwork, what's the evidence? Most people go to that museum and say, well, there is the evidence right there. But they didn't realize they didn't find the whole thing. Okay? They still should have asked great artwork, what's the evidence for that guy right there? Well, we have a skull. And this skull was sent to schools and museums around the country. Problem? They didn't find the whole skull, as you would think when you're looking at that nice picture. No, actually, Dr. Hans Thweissen was interviewed about the blowhole and what they actually found, and he admitted they didn't find the whole skull, even though they shipped that model cast all over this country. All right? 
So what do you find? Only the portions of that creature that are dark in color. That's all you have. All right. And so that's not a whole lot, is it? Hmm, not enough. And by the way, they used to say there's some rudimentary legs there or vestigial legs. And right there where the red circle is, you say, see those bones? Those used to be legs. And that's what the icon was for years and years and years. Okay, those are legs. So we know whales used to walk on land. Turns out in 2014, researchers, here's what they said, turn a long accepted evolutionary assumption on its head. And by the way, this is not from a creationist publication. Notice in the bottom, USC, that's University of Southern California news release. Okay, that's what it is. And that was in 2014. And now, what do they figure out is very important. Let's just leave it in the, as in the re reproductive cycle of the whale. All right. How many have heard that dinosaurs evolved into birds? Yeah, there you go. Got a lot of hands coming up. Well, yeah, that's what we're taught, isn't it? Hmm. Remember those nice pictures in National Geographic? Then they give you a beautiful picture inside. They show you the fossil. A lot of people don't know it uh, unless you get into studying it. But that guy on the upper left that was in National Geographic, it turns out, was a hoax. Nope. Newspaper article disputed it a number of years later. And uh, sure enough, they found out the whoever put it together and sold it to a museum put together five different skeletons. Five different ones. And then sold it and made a good profit. Okay? And so, unfortunately, that's what happened. Pretty soon, others began to fall out of the sky, too. You know, when they put these pictures in uh, National Geographic, Storrs Olson, who is the, was a bird expert at the Smithsonian Institute, put it this way. He accused the magazine of not receiving competent consultation in certain scientific ma matters. He's especially galled or maddened by the society's assertion that a wide variety of dinosaurs definitely wore feathers. This is just a lot, I have a blankety blank lie, he says. There is not one undisputed example of a dinosaur with feathers. None. The public deserves to know this. All right, now, Niall, uh, Alan Fiducia, uh, University of North Carolina, I think, he said, when they put that feathered dinosaur on the cover last year, I threw 30 years worth of magazine out of my house. He said, National Geographic's journalism is a joke. Now, Alan Fiducia is still an evolutionist, all right? But he doesn't like what some of his colleagues have been doing, okay? He says the hair-like filaments that accompany some fossils come from beneath the skin. I can duplicate the effect by skinning the tail of a modern lizard. Don't do it at home, okay, kids? No, no, it's not a good idea, especially on the kitchen table. My mom didn't like that. Okay. <laughs> Another one fell out of the sky, okay, there, another one, they added a tail to the fossil and then sold it to a museum. National Geographic had this nice picture of how a leg is going to turn into a wing and actually shows the name of this dinosaur that supposedly was associated with that. Well, guess what? What you're looking at on top is great artwork. And it's imagination is what it is. And uh, they show you exactly what's going on until you get the modern birds. But there is a problem. That's not the order they found these in. We have an artist that worked with uh, AOI. He still works with us, but uh, in a different capacity. But anyhow, uh, there's the real order. The real order. And sure enough, guess what you find here? You find modern birds way up there where they're supposed to be, kind of flying around today. But look, you find modern birds before the supposed dinosaurs that evolved into the birds, right? 
you can't be your own grandmother. It's a big problem. And so, uh, so what did the evolutionists say? Kevin Padian, who's been pushing this dinosaur to bird evolution, says, ah, no problem. <laughs> At the University of California, Berkeley, he said, we don't always get everything in the fossil record in perfect order. That just begs the question, doesn't it? Yeah, it does matter. I, uh, can you imagine what a half bird, half dinosaur just might look like? Huh? You know, I'm looking at that and thinking, oh my. I like to hike and I don't want to meet one of those. And I don't think you do either, okay? All right, then Archaeopteryx. Turns out, if, as they did more studies on it, they said, it flies like a true bird. Type of feathers that you see. So my question here is, so did dinosaurs <coughs> evolve into birds? No. Nope. In fact, PLOS One magazine said in 2012, they found a theropod dinosaur with three birds in its stomach. They weren't evolving in the birds, they were eating them. All right, three birds in the stomach. A lot of people don't know it because you've been given the, the geologic column and this is where you find these creatures, this is where you find those, right? It turns out the fossils of modern birds, sandpipers, loons, ducks, flamingos, comorons, albatross, parrots, owls, penguins, robins, all found in dinosaur layers along with even mammals that weren't supposed to be there. Opossums, hedgehogs, boat constrictors, that's not a mammal, but uh, a snake and reptiles, salamanders, all things found in dinosaur rock layers. I didn't realize that when I was growing up. I wish I did. Now they found an ancient petrified salamander, and it's actually revealing its last meal. Okay. Huh. Wait a minute, soft tissue on organs? Preserved? Yeah, that's been a problem for evolution right now. A big one, you've probably been hearing more and more about it. Especially if you had, was it Mark Armitage? I was thinking it was Mark Armitage, wasn't it? Yeah, if he came to talk to you, you understand. They have found a lot of uh, soft tissue now in dinosaur fossils. Soft tissue, pliable tissue, as well as red blood cells, also uh, parts of DNA strands, okay? All found in dinosaur fossils. And anyhow, uh, one of the, uh, Schweitzer was one of them doing the study with Jack Horner, the paleontologist, and she started seeing the soft tissue, working with the dinosaur that Jack Horner had brought in. And he's, she said, what is this? Looked at it, it was soft, pliable tissue. And finally she said, Jack, Jack, come over here. What do you make of this? Jack poked around and said, hmm, hmm, you know, that kind of thing. And then he said, well, I don't know, but I can tell you one thing, those creationists are gonna love you. <laughs> but she tried to get her data published. Nobody would look at it. She said, I had one reviewer tell me that he didn't care what the data said. <laughs> he knew what I was finding wasn't possible. I wrote back and said, well, what data would convince you? He said, none. Hey, we had the same thing happen. We were speaking down in Iowa, had a meeting with a professor from 7 o'clock in the morning or in the afternoon to midnight. And finally, we asked him a question. What data would convince you? He said, absolutely nothing. Same thing, right? We should have asked him that at 7 o'clock. <laughs> saved a lot of the evening, okay? But we see this sort of thing all the time. Okay. All right. So now they're finding a bunch of soft tissue in the, in the uh, dinosaur bone. We had a professor at the university that actually stood up and said, oh, it's just biofilm. That means it came much, much, much later, okay? It wasn't part of the original fossils. But now that was proven wrong, okay? That was wrong. And they know it's soft tissue. So now their Schweitzer even is going through checking on what the control might be on iron. 
And where do you get a lot of iron? Blood. All right? Concentrated hemoglobin, maybe. And so she soaked some ostrich tissue in concentrated hemoglobin for quite a long time. Two years later, found out it hadn't rotted yet. And so he said, aha, that's the answer. Well, two years, maybe. Thousands, maybe? But 180 million years, how are you going to do that? There's a problem there, right? That's really extrapolating the data. And by the way, iron is not present with a lot of those fossils where they're finding soft tissue. Uh, now, where do you get the concentrated hemoglobin? Go to the lab. You don't find it in the natural world, do you? And then you have to keep it dry. You have to keep it dry, but you have to bury it deeply and rapidly. And most of these dinosaurs, you know what they're found in? What you, us geologists call fluvial or river bank deposits. You're not going to keep it dry there, are you? No. And so there's problems even with that particular research right there. All right. Here's another one they found now. Uh, they said over 500 million year old creature, okay? 500, it's still soft tissue. How could that happen? It's hard enough just to think 10 years, isn't it? Let alone all those years. They have found pliable reptile skin and dinosaur skin. What I like about that, when I look at it, I don't see feathers. But you know what? I have no problem if they find a dinosaur or something like that with a gorgeous headdress of feathers. I have no problem with that. I just have a problem of putting feathers on him or it before or if they didn't have it, okay? Without knowing, just slapping feathers on them. And that's what's happening a lot today. And that's what you see in many museums. Okay, now we're talking about dinosaurs. Should I even mention these? <laughs> I'll just mention it. We have a lot of dinosaur bones. When I was a kid, I used to hunt and petrify dinosaur bones. Did you know that? I did. In fact, when I was a kid, I polished a lot of petrified dinosaur bone. Cut and polished it. And we made jewelry out of it. Okay? And uh, I remember when I was uh, doing that, a few times, I'd be grinding along, and I'd get this horrible rotten egg smell. I'm grinding through rotting flesh. The significance of it never hit me. Never realized the significance. There's no way that could be so many millions of years old. Okay? That would have been the natural conclusion. It might mean that dinosaurs were much more recent than we are taught. And that goes along with some of the things that we're seeing around the world, pictures coming in. Now they're pictures. But Marco Polo visited China, 1271 AD, reported the emperor raised ch dragons to pull his chariots in the parade. I go to the university, I ask them a question. How many here believe in dragons? Maybe one hand inside of his shirt, <laughs> afraid to admit it. Maybe. <laughs> but then I give them the classical definition of a dragon. A dragon was a large reptile. Now, how many of you believe in dragons? All right, you know. Okay. But that's what they were, large reptiles. Now, the question is, what were those things? What kind of large reptile do you know about? Dinosaurs, right? We believe they were reptiles. You go to the, uh, the uh, Natural Bridges National Monument. I like taking students there. We did lighten that up so it's easier to see. But what is it? Dinosaur. Okay. Um, about 1,000 to 2,000 years old on the cave rocks uh, in Utah. Okay. Here's Arizona, Havasu Canyon. Look at that guy. It's a dead ringer for Edmontosaurus, isn't it? That we know in the museum. That guy is out of an Asian collection about, oh, I would say somewhere around 1400 A.D. Uh, the thing is, it's a dead ringer for Oviraptor in a clay. Dead ringer for it. 
Okay, here's the Amazon River Basin. These guys are hunting something. What is that creature down there? Kind of looks like a sauropod dinosaur, doesn't it? Maybe, huh? What are these guys hunting? Is that Big Bird from Sesame Street, or is that Crithosaurus? You just don't know, do you? You don't know. Here are sauropods on an ornamental box, very ancient. It looks like dinosaurs to me. The Mesopotamian seal, more dinosaurs, and there's the, probably the type of dinosaur it was. Okay, now here's a, a from Bible.ca, and uh, you find out what, what is that uh, thing next to his head? Let's look up a little closer. It looks like a stegosaurus, right? This is on a temple about a thousand years old, okay, and uh, in Cambodia. I have a feeling they were seeing those things in the jungles of Cambodia. That's my conclusion, okay? Down in Mexico, they find a lot of figurines of people with uh, things like stegosauruses, pterodactyls, etc. All right, in, 19, in 1496, uh, Bishop Bell was buried in Carlisle Cathedral, and there was a bass, uh, brass engravement all the way around that looked like that dinosaur right there. Yeah. I have a feeling that what we are seeing as dinosaurs had another name called dragons. <laughs> okay? That was the modern term. Uh, that was the term they used. Today, dinosaur, which was first coined in the 1800s, right? That was the first time they used that word. Okay, now this was Stanford University. They had a humanities press release, and they were going to have a lecture. And here's what the article came out. Dinosaurs and dragons? Oh, my. Stanford fossil historian links dinosaur bones to mythological creatures. Ha, ha, ha. Right? What if they were true? And then they found this particular skull that I think she was mentioning as well. They called it Dracorex Hogwartsia. <laughs> That's the name. There it is. And then she said this about it. The skull looks strangely familiar to anyone who has studied dragons. Dracorex has a remarkable resemblance to the dragons of ancient China and medieval Europe. Now, every one of those, that's not the horn. That is the base of the horn. The horn will come off of that, just like cattle today, right? So, so that's going to have a bunch of horns on it, and it fits nicely with some of the pictures of dragons that we see. Oh, so what's the answer from the evolutionists on this one? The people in China and medieval Europe must have seen the bones of Dracorax. And that's where we get all the legends of the dragons from. But the problem is the skull, you know where it was found? North Dakota. <laughs> Not anywhere else, okay? Hmm, so maybe... Uh, it might mean something very substantial there. St. George got his fame killing dragons. I don't know if you know that. Uh, but anyhow, there are four different plates, at least, of him killing a dragon. Every one of the dragons looked like a type of dinosaur that we have in museums today. So maybe so. Okay, some important books for you right there on our book table. Uh, are the dinosaurs, uh, the DVD, Dragons or Dinosaurs? It's a documentary. And that one you might really enjoy. And I love that one on the bottom there. That's a fun book for kids, but it turns out the adults love it too. <laughs> okay? All these little windows you open, the windows you get more information. Yeah. But anyhow, I have that book right here too. And uh, National Geographic. Talk about artwork, right? Here's their picture of what man used to look like. It's great artwork, isn't it? All right, great artwork. All right, he's told to a textbook. You see all these monkey-like creatures turning into people. And you say, great artwork, what's the evidence? What's the evidence for the guy in this bottom left? What would be the evidence? You'd hope they had the whole skeleton. And when I ask children about it, when they see it, they said, oh, yeah, they would have had the whole, the whole skeleton. Yeah. I said, no, they didn't. All they had was a skull cap for that guy. Just the lid. 
<laughs> okay, of the skull. Nothing else. Now, is that enough evidence to get that artwork? No. no. It's the artist working with the scientist that convinces young people of evolution, not the actual evidence. And we have to understand that. And they can get in trouble doing that, too. This entire scene, wow, great artwork. What's the evidence for him and her? <laughs> Turns out all they had was one tooth. Yeah, I like to say one tooth, the whole tooth, but nothing but the tooth. <laughs> Anyhow. But I guess truth doesn't matter much anymore. <laughs> Anyhow, does it? So, oh, what's the evidence? By the way, that tooth wasn't even a human tooth. It belonged to a pig, they found out. Yep. Yeah, uh huh. Piltdown Man was nothing but a hoax. Somebody took the jaw of an ape, filed on the teeth, put it together with the skull of a modern man, then hid it for a scientist to find. And sure enough, they found it, they took the bait, and here's what they thought he looked like. Okay. All right. No, this is what they thought he looked like. Piltdown Man. Problem is, this stood as proof for human evolution for decades in the textbook, 60, 70 years later. But within two decades of when it was brought in, they already dismissed it. They knew it was false, but try to get it out of the textbooks, okay? Or the museums. It's still in the museums and some. All right. This is Ron Pithecus, second grade book. Did you catch that? Second grade book used in the Grand Junction area. Kids are being doc indoctrinated at young, young ages. Uh, dinosaurs, where do they start getting indoctrinated into evolution? Kindergarten, four years old. Yeah. Well, a, a, a second grader should say, hey, great artwork, what's the evidence? Turns out, two small jaw, pieces of a jaw, and that's all they had. That was it, two small pieces. And they got the whole family in there, too. All right. Uh, Johansson found Lucy in Ethiopia. Uh, and he uh, said it's about two thirds of a skeleton. And he played around with putting the ribs looking different directions, okay? One looked more human like. He was able to do it, get away with that for a long time until people kind of got onto his case for that. But then he showed a knee joint in a lecture. And he said this knee joint shows the creature could have walked on two legs. Now, you all probably know this. Where was the knee joint found, Dr. Johansson? that you showed in your picture. Turns out, eh, two to three miles away. Why did you put them together? He said, well, they were similar. Well, great. That doesn't mean much, does it? Uh, not at all. And uh, so, good enough. Did you notice Lucy didn't have a head or hands or feet? You go to the Denver Museum, what do you find? Or the one here, probably the St. Louis Museum is the one in the upper right. Yeah, you got a gorgeous face for Lucy there, right? And, though, and now he's hanging on with his hands, hanging on with his feet. Great artwork. And this convinces young people that evolution is true. And your job is to convince them that it isn't, okay? Lucy, the French Academy of Sciences said this, in clear back in 1999, the they said that the apes, which you're right, of the species Australopithecus did not represent the origin of man. They should be removed from the relevant family tree. But it's still there. It's still there. This is out of a textbook. It says here, Tim White made this reconstruction of an afarensis skull, that's Lucy and friends, using parts of not one, not two, but several individuals. He says the section at the back of the skull is a crushed cranium mentioned in the text. It contains 107 separate pieces. You're going to make it look like whatever you want, right? So that's the problem. Now, Time Magazine was talking about some scraps of a skull, and then they made the claim, this toe bone proves a creature walked on two legs. Problem was, toe bone was found 10 miles away. But they assumed it was the same species. There's a lot of room for error there 
when they do that. And by the way, the one who's blowing the whistle on that one is Johansson, who actually did that with Lucy. He doesn't like it when somebody else does it. All right. Now you might write in to Ida or maybe Artie, both introduced in 2009. Do you realize that 2009 was a very important year for evolutionists? It was. Why did they introduce him that year? Because it would have been Charles Darwin's uh, 200th birthday. Got to get something for poor old Charles Darwin, right? And then two, and then two, the other one was celebrating the 150th anniversary of the publication of Charles Darwin's book on the origin of species. All right? Now, problem. When I first looked at the fossil of Artie, I found out what they were saying. It was like putting together powder. That means you can put it and make it look like anything you want, right? That's basically what they're saying here. All right, so putting together powder. And I also looked at that and said, ooh, Artie, what long arms you have. <laughs> what is it? Knuckle walking ape, probably, if it's anything. But then again, they never had the whole skeleton like they show you. In fact, they have a, uh, see that skull in all the different colors of Artie? Different pieces from, thir from uh, 32 separate individuals. Composite. All right, many things wrong with that, and uh, we're not going to go any further on that one. So next time they come up with something new, like Nality. Oh, September 2015. Okay, what you need to do is say, wait and see. What are the journals going to say in two years? Or even one year? And then Later, they came up. They thought this is a great uh, link. Portion showing indications of iodine deficiency. Many bones broken in the same spots. That was the hunted, not the hunter. Why? You're getting the bone marrow out of there, right? That was considered a delicacy. Uh, drastically younger than originally thought. Uh, crush bones fragments they were hit on top of the head and indication of sediment transport causing mixing and so basically if you want the latest that I know of that's really good uh, go to uh, the book here contested bones okay uh, includes the latest on human evolution all those that I mentioned already another wonderful book remember that uh, evolution the fossils say no this is much better, okay? It has wonderful pictures in it all the way through, glossies. We have that one over here, too. The Fossil Record, Dr. John Morris and Dr. Frank Sherwin, okay? So the next time you see a new face on the block, you have to ask some questions. Do they really know that? That's great artwork, right? Then look at those skulls. Oh, they're showing you the skulls. And then you ask another question. <clears throat> is it a composite? Is it a composite? Every one of those skulls are, are composites, by the way. Okay? Composite, put together from several pieces. All right? And so important to ask the question, what's the evidence? Is it a composite, etc.? cetera? And uh, when you do that and you teach your kids and your grandkids and the kids walking down the street, <laughs> then they're gonna, you're going to get somewhere, possibly. Okay, so what do the fossils indicate? We see complexity everywhere we look, don't we? We think, see things staying put and distinct groups. And we see evidence of rapid burial. That's another lecture I'll be doing at the University of Minnesota on Thursday. Okay, it's the evidence, geologic, archeological, cultural evidence that there really was a flood, all right? That's coming up on Thursday. Um, let's see. Wednesday night at the university, we have, a, there's a couple of flyers on that table. We'll tell you where to get it. But uh, that's all I have seen. If, are there more? Uh, a couple of flyers. Uh, Tate Hall at the university, room 105. Starts at 7 on uh, Wednesday night. Mary Jo and I will be talking about the amazing 
evidence of design as well as the best proofs of evolution from a biological standpoint fail. Okay? She's a biologist. And she's convinced me living things are more exciting. And I love the design. Okay? I love the design. And then Wednesday night, you're going to see a program very similar to what you just saw. Thursday. Oh, Thursday night. Thursday night. And uh, so Thursday night, same room, fossil record. Okay? And uh, so I encourage you all to come out. Friday night is the flood lecture. Okay? So very much. All of what we showed you, even with the fossil record, supports the creation, the fall, and the flood. Now, anyhow, so make sure you visit our website, discovercreation.org. If you have a question that you don't get answered tonight, send it to me at Dave Nutting at discovercreation.org. Okay? So that's what you want to do. It's all very important to do it. Mary Jo mentioned that we do have a Costa Rica tour. That's coming up February 25 to March 5. If you're at all interested, give me your address and I'm going to send you information real quick, okay? All right. Uh, Yellowstone tours, three of them next summer as well. So the Costa Rica, amazing design in Costa Rica. Absolutely amazing design. And... Uh, you guys were at that yellow, that uh, Costa Rica tour. Is it worth going to? Definitely. Yes, definitely. This last year, I had everybody arriving for the tour. The tour was starting on Sunday evening. Saturday night, I end up in the hospital in Costa Rica with COVID. I, Mary Jo and I missed the entire tour. But we've been training Oscar and several others down in Costa Rica, and they were able to take over just like that. Oscar did a great job. As you would expect, he probably could. All right? But anyhow, we missed the whole tour. But about the day that the tour ended, guess what? I felt 100% perfect already. <laughs> and I was ready to go do the university speaking and some of the other church speaking. So not a whole waste, okay? So anyhow. So... Uh, Yellowstone, if you've never been there, even if you have been, you need a creation tour there. It's amazing, okay? Amazing one there. All right, I already mentioned these books here, and I'd highly recommend it. Okay? So, we do have a DVD series over there, too, uh, that's good for fourth grade through adult Sunday school classes. Uh, special price. Yeah, I know it says $50 on there and $5 on the study guide, but you get the whole thing for $35 tonight. Okay, I highly recommend it. And by the way, it would really be a help to us if you're thinking about buying some books, do it tonight. Because I don't take them to the university. I'm not going to get much going on there. But do it tonight, and uh, that will keep us from having to ship all those back. Okay? And you've got a separate thing, too. You can get your entire Christmas list shopping done. All right? Instead of Uncle Bill getting a tie, he gets a creation book. All right? Now, one of the, uh, a couple great ones, too, is censored science. We have a lot about our censor uh, uh, group today, don't we? Censoring all over. Censored science, the same way. All right? Have you considered by, uh, hey, you might recognize that name up there on the bottom, along with Bruce Malone, Julie, and uh, anyhow, I highly recommend that book. We sell probably more of those than a lot of other books at AOI. Okay? We do. People love it. Good job. Good job with what you guys have done. And uh, then there's another one called um, Without Excuse. Now, I don't happen to have one here. We sold them already. <laughs> but you have a couple over here on this table, along with some free books over there that you're giving out, right? And so uh, make sure you avail yourself of those resources. Guidebooks, the Grand Canyon, Zion, uh, Zion and Bryce, and Yellowstone. We do that. And by the way, if you're interested, we actually put out a phone app tour of Yellowstone National Park. And according to one super uh, 
National Park Superintendent. He said this is better than anything the National Park has produced. Okay? And it's a, from a creationist perspective, by the way. And it is amazing. It's so, uh, so good. Uh, High-tech cell, that's a good one, too. $10. Genetic entropy, we have a few copies of that. Showing why mutation, natural selection, does not work. Okay? And go to our website. Mary Jo, anything else you want to add? Whew, like, when are you going to quit talking? <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> Appreciate it. Go ahead. So in a lot of like creation stuff, they show getting on the ark like very like basic of one of like the kind like the kind of lion or like a cross between them all. You showed a tiger looking on one of the tigers. Would you expect that they took more like tigers and stuff like that on the ark? Uh, they probably took a basic kind, and I'm not sure what that kind would have looked like. But we do see in the fossil record something that looks like a tiger, right? We see that. And so what were the kinds? That still is a big question to find those boundaries of those kinds, okay? And uh, so that's uh, very difficult to answer, uh, this side of heaven. And, uh, but uh, we do know, like, dog kinds can proliferate. Look at the great big dogs, the little dogs, the spotted dogs, and chihuahuas, St. Bernard's. They're all the dog kind. And so, no, it wouldn't happen to take that. By the way, how big was that boat, do you know? How about one and a half to two football fields in length? Three decks, and you can put all the animals that had to go on board on one of the three decks. That's all it would take. Okay? That's all it takes. Good. No, you know how big it is. <laughs> wow. That's great. Yeah. Yeah. At the, uh, at the International Conference on Creationism this summer, we had the privilege of attending. We didn't attend anything there. No, we're not this But there were some of the researchers who are doing research into questions like what are the boundaries of the kinds and how do we have, how do we have, uh, how can we, discover what that might be. We have to start with what we have now and work backwards, so we, because we're looking at what the original creative kinds were. But the, the researchers that are working on that have coined a new idea called baramine, which means created kind. And they're trying to take the classification system that we use today and you know, see how it fits with what those original created kinds might be. So there is some active research going on into that question. And you could get a hold of those scientific papers if you were interested in that. Um, in essence, uh, we walked side by side with all of creation before the flood, all of these fossils. Um, and they were found in the flood in the sediment layers. How come there's no humans in the sediment layers, no human fossils? That's a really good question. I do know from a biblical aspect, God blotted mankind off of the face of the earth. Uh, boy, is that like erased him? Very much so. Besides that, humans bloat and float when they, when they drown. Bloat and float. I have a feeling the great white sharks were having a day. Okay, and other type creatures uh, that were better off in the water than on top of the boat, by the way. Uh, and so that's one great answer right there. And now, they also live around the waterways, and in a flood, they're going to be washed far out into the sea. And uh, uh, do you understand how few humans are there compared to some of those other animals? It's amazing. And feel your skin. You see, it's fragile. Man, in a flood environment where there's so awful much... Uh, sedimentation and high velocity current in many places you there won't be anything left if you were in that flood there won't be much left out of, in a short while and so that's one of the things where you do find uh, the more intricate things is where you find the calmer parts of the water 
And uh, in Moab, Utah, they do have a skeleton there uh, that uh, the gentleman who found it, uh, who owns the rock shop there in Moab, Utah, by the way, he is up there, in, really up there in age right now. Uh, but uh, he used, uh, he would always say that they had found uh, a couple of human skeletons in the very, some very same way or that they find dinosaur fossils in there near Moab, Utah. And uh, there was a, the first publication, uh, somebody was disputing it and they said, no, these fossils were put down exactly when these layers were put down. And yet, uh, uh, you might look up Moab man, and you might be able to find it. And uh, then they said, oh, he was just buried there later, later. Uh, mining, all right? It doesn't look like it, okay? Didn't look like it. Who was, who was the guy that went to the museum and said he found that they had to put a lot of the specimens back? If they didn't fit, they put them back into the storage rooms and so Jack was off, Quasa? Yeah. Yeah, Jack Quasa. And, and so that is also a question that I have oftentimes is what has been found really, but if it didn't fit the accepted paradigm, is it even... And what have they done with those fossils? Because we have we have other cases where we know that things have been set aside or just quietly dismissed by hiding the evidence, basically. So I had an opportunity one time to go with some a gentleman uh, to go find some monkey bones that are found in the Shinley Formation, which is below the dinosaurs. I said, are they monkey or are they human? He said, I don't know. <laughs> but the problem with that is, I didn't go. I didn't go. I was too biased to give us that possibility. And he seemed a little bit weird to go with, so. <laughs> he was a creationist. He must have been. <laughs> no. <laughs> you see, I was biased that way too, and to the point I wouldn't even look at certain things. When somebody brought the arrowhead of a backbone into Grand Junction, Colorado, but this one had a, uh, a, well, it was a backbone of a dinosaur. I said, forget it, it can't be true. Somebody must have glued the arrowhead to the backbone of the dinosaur. That's my answer. And I forgot it, I never would go look at it, even though I drove right past where it was on display. I never would go look at it, because my bias wouldn't allow me to. How much bias enters in in determining what you're finding and what you're going to call it or what you're going to ignore because it doesn't fit the paradigm. So I'm I, I afraid I ignored some things because it didn't fit my paradigm. Okay. Yeah? Question about the art. Yeah. So the art lens on the high peak. for a year, right? And then afterwards, yeah, how long did they stay uh, right there at that very location and still find food there? Uh, because there is so much room on that ark for food, not only just the animals, but for food, okay? So how long do they take before they actually embarked entirely and went their ways? It's hard telling. Um, so uh, it's a possibility that uh, they had enough food on board that boat, okay? Um, I don't know if uh, Noah, I don't know if Noah was told he's gonna be on the boat for 371 days. But finally, you find out after 371 days, God said, time to leave the boat, Noah, okay? I remember the, uh, the dog that was sent out to there's, so, so things must have sprouted up fairly quickly after the time of the flood. It's interesting, you know, you always wish God would have put in a few more chapters to answer <laughs> some of these questions. So clarifying okay. words. Let's clarify that just a bit. Yeah. 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 Excuse me, but what, what, how, how were you going to be at at the university? Tate. Tate Hall, room 105. Starts at seven o'clock. Seven o'clock. 
that same nights. room all three nights. It's always nice to have a few friendly faces. <laughs> oh yeah, that's really nice. <laughs> what a couple of, what was it, a couple of years ago we had the most vocal Minnesotan atheist well known uh, show up at our presentations. Jay. What's that? Mr. J. His last name starts with a J. No, it's a different one. It was a different one. But it was okay. You know, and, and we were happy. It's glad to have him. Right. Yeah, I, I did a lecture on design. After that lecture on design, uh, finally he, he held his peace. He's really known for just absolutely disrupting the whole thing. All right? But he held his peace. Question and answer, he finally got the best of him. And he had to say, I came here to hear evidence of design. You didn't give me any evidence of design. And if you don't give me any evidence for design right now, I'm going to throw up all over this throw in front of me. Somebody in the back of the auditorium hollered, give him a bag. <laughs> <laughs> you never know what you're going to encounter there <laughs> at, the, at the university. <laughs> and oftentimes, the, you know, we'll do a presentation and they'll do question and answer and so on. And that's great. But the best time is talking with students one-on-one -on -one or a few at a time afterwards. Because that way you can really get into what, what, what is the real depth of what they're really asking. And, and oftentimes get into discussions that are deeper than the scientific evidence. Mm -hmm. sure. So we would encourage you to come, though, and bring somebody that needs to hear. You, yeah, uh, please do. Enjoyed this one tonight. You know, come to bring somebody. Great place for evangelism. Cool. Yeah, it is. It's and we've had we've had students, you know, that have come and, and years later they got a hold of us and said, you know, what you talked about really made some sense. Sometimes it takes a long time. Sometimes they won't admit it right there. They've got to be on the defensive. And uh, we see sometimes the, the atheists clubs showing up to defend their territory. And In mass sometimes, <laughs> and other times apathy rules, yeah. unfortunately. Now, we were down at Mankato this last week, and um, we, had, we had several students that came that we knew were skeptics. And you can yeah, usually yeah. tell when they walk in the door. They either look very sheepish, or they look like, I hope nobody sees me coming, or they've got this funny laugh, you know, like, <laughs> Kind of yeah, wait till you see this. But these guys listened, and they had some good questions at the end. Yeah. I, really, I really appreciated that because they were respectful questions, and they were asking because they wanted to know. It wasn't like, you know, sometimes you get the questions, they're just trying to nail you to the wall with. <laughs> but these, these, these young people really had some good questions. So We had one doctor student that was uh, studying uh, to, to be a doctor from uh, Uganda. No, or... Uganda, and after the lecture on uh, biology and design, he, he raised his hand, we called on him, he says, you've just destroyed everything I've been taught. <laughs> he was confused. Yeah, he was, because he had been taught that mutation plus natural selection would lead to, you know, onward, upward evolution. It doesn't. And Afterwards, I asked him, well, how many, because we, we had a good chance to talk to him for one-on-one, -on -one, and he was, he was concerned about, well, aren't there any good mutations, you know? And if you, if you have that question, that book, Genetic Entropy, is actually, yeah. uh, Dr. John Sanford, I highly recommend that book for you. And so I was talking to him about that, and just as he, he was still kind of, you know, wavering and I asked him at the end, I said, well, how many good mutations do you think it might take to go from a single cell organism all the way up to a human being with a brain like yours? And he went, I never thought of that. <laughs> Interesting. Really, you know, sometimes it's just some little thing that can, can spark an interest, that can make somebody start to question, mm -hmm. like a bicep board. <laughs> yeah, you never know what it takes. By the way, Dr. Gish, who wrote that book, 
he loved that story, that testimony that we had about giving his book for five cents. And, and how it changed our lives. Yeah, we were with him, you know, he'd always go, tell him about my book. Tell him about my book. <laughs> every, every time. <laughs> I think your question. Well, I just had to kind of jump to another kind of topic, but did, get, visited a friend. They found about an 18 inch by 20 inch uh, petrified looked like a petrified tree, a trunk of a petrified tree. It had striations, it wasn't a granular. Um, I'm not aware of all of the um, forms of rock that can look like a petrified tree. But it looked like a petrified tree. And I was wondering if you're aware of any um, natural event other than the conditions that existed at the time of the flood that could have occurred and, and there was a little bit of a twist. It's because it appeared like there were um, like there were straight edges of a part of the outer surface of this 18 by 20 inch trunk, and it looked uh, yeah. as though it had been sawed. Okay. Um, and you know there can be some degradation of some portions of surfaces, and yeah. the balance be a, a you know an intact fossil. Um, I can rule out that. But any natural I processes after the flood that have been tried to fossilize the trees? Petrification. How long, it begs the question, how long does it take to petrify something? And uh, they were doing studies in um, Japan where they have a lot of hot springs. And they were finding out things were being petrified to a degree, and sometimes a greater degree, in a matter of a couple of years. So it's a possibility. You go to the Yellowstone National Park where we give these tours, and we'll show you some stuff that's already mineralized. And uh, the upper part of the tree are still standing, but the bottom part is mineralized, OK? That's partially type of petrification. Uh, and if you put them in the silico hot spring water, it guess what? It doesn't take long to petrify something. I think that's what they found in the Japanese deposits, right? Now, I'd love to see a whole lot more research done on that one because I did some quick calculations, and uh, my calculations were showing that the, uh, the petrification, once it started, the amount of petrification over time was going up exponentially. Okay? That was a limited sample, so I would like to see a whole lot more samples to analyze. Okay? So... If somebody knows about that, I'd love to know more. You can also look at Petrified National Forest, they call it down in, down in Arizona. Mm -hmm. We think it was a petrified log jam, not a forest growing in that location, but you'll oftentimes see these log logs that are, they, they've just fractured in sections that look like they might have been sawed. So, you know, there, there's some pretty sharp breaks in those, in those big logs down there. Oh, oh, yeah. Well, that is a possibility. Good sharp breaks uh, just due to the cracking of the big logs. But if you go to Kansas, you'll find out there's some petrified fence posts there. And there are petrified fence posts other places with barbed wire on it. So you see it doesn't take long. If there are more questions, people can stick around. I know it's warm in here, so we're going to officially end the meeting. Um, Get some air. If you have more questions, you can stick around. Thank you.